going to actually open your Bibles to the book of Titus, chapter 2. And uh, it's on the screen. And this is, this is, this is, uh, this is for, not just for the days that Titus uh, wrote this, but this was also to the church today, for us today. And it says in verse number one, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, sound teaching, that the aged men be sober, brave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Now he said that the aged men now, also keep in mind that uh, he's not just talking about aged men, but I want you to see this part where it says, for them to be sober, brave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. And in verse number three, it says that the aged women likewise. Now, I highlighted that, and I put it in parentheses, so you will see that he's also saying likewise, which means that the aged women are also supposed to be sober, brave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience, that they, that they be in behavior as becoming holiness, not false accusers, not giving too much wine, teachers of what kind of things? Good things. Now, before I go on, I want you to know that this requires wisdom from seasoned women in the Lord. Seasoned women. Now, I didn't... I don't want to use the term age women because a lot of women don't believe the age. Uh, however, so I put the term seasoned women. So we do know that there are some seasoned women in the church. Amen. And, you know, I really believe, too, that if we get to a point where we actually understand that when a person uh, is, is a seasoned person, they have gone through different seasons in life. They've been able to deal with different things. They've been able to overcome a lot of things in their life because they have gone through many seasons. These are people who have, uh, women who have gone through different things, but they may, they stay faithful to God. You know, I mean, because, you know, when you're faithful to God, <clears throat> it doesn't mean that everything's going to go fine for you. Everything's going to go good. Everything is going to be uh, right. You're going to have to go through different trials and tests. Amen. And, I mean, even if you're not a child of God, you're still going to go through trials and tests. You're going to go through different challenges. But if you are a, a child of God, then you'll know how to go through it. See, being a child of God, you want to avoid, you want to avoid going through it. But it's something when you come out of it. See, it's not what you go through, it's how you come out. It's yeah. yeah. like we're talking about Stronger Than My Struggles, but it's theme for 2018. And it's not so much as how you go in your struggles, it's how you come out of those struggles. I have every intention, whatever struggle I go through, to come out victorious. You say, well, how can you be so uh, uh, confident in that? Because my God is a victorious God. Amen. He has made me triumph in everything. He has. See, he gets the glory. So it has nothing to do with my ability or my strength. Because the Bible tells me I'm supposed to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, right? So I'm not boasting on myself, but I can sure make my boast in him. Amen. And if anybody can make their boast in him, I don't know who you boast in him, but I'm going to boast in my God. Amen? Because my God never fails. Amen. My God never loses. My God never is lacking anything. So I can always come to him, and so can you. And that means in whatever season that I'm going through, I know that he's going to always be there. He's not intimidated by your seasons of, of lack, your seasons of trial, your seasons of uh, uh, struggles. As a matter of fact, many times we don't even realize that's when God show up the biggest in our life when we're going through these different trials and tests and temptations. Amen? And so you have, a lot of times, you have, like the, the Bible said, the aged women or the, the seasoned women, uh, they need to teach the young women. So many times we have the wrong people teaching the young folks. We have all these different uh, social networks that teach them. We have different people who, <coughs> can we grab this mic here? Yeah. Can we get ready? <coughs> can we use it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when you get this one ready, let me know. I'll go back. You have said something wrong to me. And uh, they, even at home, have you ever had someone to come to your house and you have to tell them, What's wrong with you, boy? You better speak of Girl, you better speak. Have you ever done that? Yes. It's, it's strange how it is. 
Uh, and you know, I think it's at the same time you want to be protected because around strangers, you don't want them to get too friendly around strangers. But, you know, sometimes you can be friendly without making everybody your friend. Right. You know, you have to be courteous. You can be courteous. Just speak to people. Well, there is a culture now that we have in a subculture that says that if you uh, somehow you look soft or you don't be hard or you don't whatever get this appearance, that somehow you are weak or you are soft or whatever. And that's why we need godly people to step up who know we're confident in who we are and confident that we can speak and be courteous without uh, being intimidated by a group of people because we know who we are. Amen. Amen. That's why I said this requires wisdom from seasoned women in the Lord. Notice I didn't say seasoned women in the church. Right. I said in the Lord. Amen. Amen. You'll see where I'm going with this because the Bible says here in verse number 4 of Seal Titus chapter 2 that they may teach the young women to what? Be to be sober. To do what? Love. And to do what? Now, this is what I'm going to focus on, to love their children, to love their children. Uh, just so you, so you know, it says in verse number five, it says to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own others, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So here's what I want to focus on. I want to focus on love their children. Because when you have a home... Uh, it's up to the adult to develop what I call a, loaf, a loving culture in the home. See, children, uh, we're going to do what children do. There's a scripture in the Bible that when I was a child, I understood as a child. I thought as a child. I reasoned as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, there's a difference between childish and childlike. See, we can be childlike but not childish. When you are, when you, if you give a child responsibility that they haven't matured enough and haven't received enough to handle, then you're putting uh, authority in the wrong hands. When we, as we mature in the things of God, what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to set the standards in the home. And we're supposed to demonstrate the same kind of love that God loved us with. That kind of love is supposed to be unconditional. But at the same time, it's not that old syrupy kind of mushy kind of love where you just let your children do whatever they want to do. You have to sit standards. You have to let them know these are certain things, these are certain behaviors we will stand for, these are certain behaviors we won't stand for. These are certain guidelines we will go to set, you will obey these guidelines. You will do this, you will do that. It has nothing to do with children submit to your parents. It's children obey your parents. Amen. And uh, parents need to understand that we have, uh, if we're going to be given authority, we have to understand who gave us the authority. Who gave us the authority to, to pro procreate? God did. So that means that someone in authority gave us the authority to even have children. Amen. Right? Amen. So then we have to be submitted to the one who gave us the authority. And then when you, when you bring those children home, uh, when you leave the hospital, they may give you some kind of care for how to take care of them and clean them and you know stuff like that. But as far as raising them up, they come from God. And when you don't do it, when you don't get it from God, then everybody kind of raise their children the way they see fit. And many times they raise their children the way that they were raised. Now, what if you got to a certain point in life and you realize, you know what? I don't want my children to come up like me. Now, I'm going to speak on my own personal behalf because I don't want no one to feel insulted or that I'm picking on them because I don't know how you was raised. But uh, I tell you this, it was a total conscious effort in my life that I wasn't going to raise my children the way that I was raised. Now, subconsciously, I still did it because it was in me. But I had to realize that my parents did not have a godly foundation. Now, my mom, she loved us. I think my dad, in his own way, he may have loved us. And I don't go back and judge him for what he didn't do because I don't know what his life was like. I do wonder sometimes but I don't go back and judge him. I don't know what he, because he didn't talk about his past. He didn't talk about his upbringing. And when he did, it was always when he was drinking and he would cry. And so he had some sad times. He didn't talk about a whole lot about happy times. So we don't know any, I don't know too much about his past. And so it had an effect on us. So I say, well, that generational curse somehow had to break. Amen. And so I made up my mind that when I gave my life to the Lord, 
that I was going to learn how to be a godly husband, a godly father. I wanted to be those things. So I, it was intentional. This is all intentional. I had to change my thinking. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. That means that things had to change. I had to change. Well, I found out that in, ever, in order to have a loving home, it don't mean that you let them do whatever they want to do. As a matter of fact, if you love your children, the first thing is protect them. So I wouldn't let them put anything in the wall cycle. I told them, you're not, you're not supposed to, don't, don't mess with anything under the sink. You know how some people say, why did you move all that? I wasn't going to rearrange my house. <laughs> I mean, just the bottom line, you know how you have to move everything? You got to put everything up to where they can't reach it? Uh -uh. I said, here's the thing. You teach them. Don't mess with this. This is no, these are not toys under the sink. Because we had bug spray and all kind of stuff. And it wasn't no toys. And matches, these are not toys. So you teach them instead of rearranging the whole house. When people would bring family over and, and little kids. And, you know, sure, you used to have what they call a lazy Susan. I don't know why they call them a lazy Susan. But she had candy in there. And uh, they said, you better put that up because so and so coming over. I said, I'm not, not going to rearrange my house. I said, when they get here, they're going to know, don't touch anything until you get permission. Right. Right. Now, some people say, well, you hard, you mean. And you know, the definition of mean and firm have really changed. Amen. Amen. If you're firm, all of a sudden you mean. Right. See, and what it really is is that you're, 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 you're sitting order, it's structured. Now, I came up in a house where there was no structure. How many of you are? No, I'm raising your hand. Don't, don't. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't have structure in my home. I didn't have structure in my life. You know, every time you, when you see a person where they are, always remember that they came from somewhere. It may not be from the same kind of culture you came from. So I always try to believe the best about people. Because you may have come from a good foundation, godly parents and all that, and you came up where you had good structure and you knew better. And, well, see, we didn't. We didn't. I mean, I'm not saying we didn't have love, but I'm saying it was a structure. So there are a lot of things that I had to learn on my own, which was a different kind of life. When you when you start a home and, and you start a life and, it's, and everything is new because you can't bring that same old stuff from the home you came out of into this home. You understand what I'm saying? So it's up to the parents, the godly parents, to develop a loving culture. And a loving culture, again, is where you love, but you are lovingly uh, structuring the way that their, their life is supposed to be. Because you should know. You should set up structures that, that, I'm not talking about where it's so rigid, where they can't do this, they can't do that. They can, no, that's legalistic. There is a difference. And legalistic is not love. You do what I tell you. You, do, you don't do what I do, you do what I say. You do it when I tell you. You get up when I tell you, don't you be a minute late. That is military. You have to be able to teach. You understand what I'm saying? A, a, love, a loving home where sometimes you'll find out that children really don't want to leave. Now, let's say spoil. But sometimes they don't want to leave. Because they, they know that they came from a loving environment. And do you know a lot of times when you have a loving environment that those children, when they start their home and their life, they have a loving environment as well? A lot of times, do you know that a lot of times that ladies, you all pick, if y'all got a godly father, a lot of times y'all pick someone like your godly father. You won't, some people, I shouldn't get into this. <laughs> Should I get into this? Yeah. Okay. I always wonder why some people who are, very, especially ladies, I don't understand why have you worked so hard, you have actually took yourself to a whole other level, not just in finances, but just you just live on a higher level, and then all of a sudden when you get ready to pick, you pick so low. Mm. <laughs> I say I shouldn't open it. <laughs> I always wonder why people, why people pick from low hanging fruit. <laughs> if it's been hanging on the 
that long and mean. Somebody who passed it up. Nobody. Why are you reaching for it? And you have elevated your life to something where you have made something out of your life. And you look up to somebody to bring you down. Well, you know me and out there. Yes, it is. You just got to look a little higher. You got to aim it higher. Amen. We're looking down and thinking that there ain't no me and there are some good. Amen. But they just don't. They just don't. They, they are like eagles. They don't flock. They soar. All right. So you want your children. And you have to be able to have that kind of mentality where you realize that you are worth if it's worth waiting for, you're worth it. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 22 and 6. I can go on there, but I said, I'm going to say her all day. Proverbs 22 and 6, it says here, very uh, familiar scripture. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. When the Bible says train up a child, you know, we need to understand exactly what that means. When it says train up a child, he says to give, cons to give consistent discipline, and instruction, drill, practice, etc., designed to impact proficiency or efficiency. It means, and I like this, to guide or teach as by subjecting them to various life experiences. When we are raising and bringing up our children and training them up, we should expose them to certain things that they're going to have to be exposed to in real life. Amen. Now, when I was recently down in Kentucky and I was teaching down at the school at this uh, Christian Academy, uh, I don't even know, my subject wasn't even about children and about raising up children, but since there were so many kids around, and I said, parents, I said, I have to say something to you. I said, many times I say, you keep your children at a certain level, not because they need you, because you need them. Yeah. And you, you thought a spirit of hush came into the room because they never heard it like that. They need their children because they're afraid that you're going to leave me all alone. That's what they're supposed to do. You're not alone, but leave you. Yes. You're going to grow up and leave me. So you make them, you try to make them dependent on you. Not because they need you, because you need them. That's another subject. But you want to be able to teach and guide them and let them experience life uh, uh, challenges. And let them experience while they're at home where they have a safety net. Yeah. So if they mess up, they're still at home. Then when they get out on their own, then they have been at least been exposed to those things. You don't hide them and shelter them and shield them from life experiences because that's not real life. And so I told my friend who's now, because he's been in this situation, him and his family, he asked me to come over and pray and minister to him and his family uh, because they are getting ready to go to another state. And they are going to go now public. They were in this little private, I call it a bubble, where you couldn't even get internet. Ask Brother Darren. Brother Darren, we, look, we tried to look at the TV. We couldn't turn on the TV. So we thought maybe we could see some CDs. We didn't have any DVDs. didn't have no DVDs. So he went to, what was it, VHSs? VHS. And the only thing you, what, would you, what would you watch? Star Wars. What was it? Star Wars. Star Wars. I think that was the latest one they had. I'm serious. It was like we was in a, I said, man, you don't, I, this is what I told my friend. He's one of the deans down there for the boys. I told him, I said, man, y'all don't even live in a real world. This ain't real. I said, you're in a bubble. He know it. So he said, I want you to talk to my family and pray because we're going to have to now. He said, I'm going to put them in public school. I said, yep. I said, it's going to be a culture shock. Because now everything going to be real. I said, now they were living in the idea. I mean, they didn't lock the doors. I mean, there were little kids just running all over. I mean, all over the place. Even we got a little nervous. Anybody watching those kids? Because, <laughs> you know, we don't see kids. We're not, we, we are guarding our kids today. We see them running around. Where are they? Who belonged to that child? That, is that child again? Right? I thought those kids running just. And I said, man, they live inside of a bubble. It's like. And I told them, and I prayed with them, and I said, you have to deal with the real world. Mm -hmm. I said, now they're going to have to understand what it's like out there because uh, it's good they got a good foundation, but now they're going to have to get exposed to how life really is out there. Sometimes parents try to protect their children from real life, and I say, no, you, you don't isolate them. You insulate them. Right. You get them prepared. You get them exposed. You let them know, hey, you're going to have to make choices. 
You can't always make choices for your children. I remember Sister Danielle, she was telling she was, was talking about her daughter. And she said, she told her daughter one time, I'm not going to make a decision for you. I'm just going to tell you there are some things that you need to consider. I remember you were mentioning that. I said, see, that's how you do it. You don't tell them, you need to do this, you need to do that. No, 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 because you're not preparing them for how they're going to leave. That's why a lot of them don't leave. Amen. Because they are, for, they used to you making decisions for them and making choices for them and taking care of the laundry. For, I mean, <laughs> It was seven boys and two girls in my house, Brother Bob. My sister never ironed for me. Never, none, never washed for me. None of that. We had old, I'm dating myself now, we had old Ringo washing. Y'all look at these young folks don't know what a Ringo wash is. I remember because I got my own caught in it. Yeah. My master said, you did? Yeah, I'm, I'm playing with it. It was fun to me. I would take it out of one side, put it in the other, it wrap it around there. I tried to grab it, my arm got caught up in there. I started hollering. Nobody came to my rescue. <laughs> my point is, is that you learn, you learn, amen. I had to iron my own clothes. My sisters, nobody ironed my own clothes. But, you know, after I had enough, we know when you, what they say, scorched them. Then I realized, okay, you don't do that. You know how you sit it down on there and you walk away and forget about it? Y'all never done that, right? <laughs> then when you put the shirt on, then you put a jacket on so nobody knows you got that big iron print. <laughs> uh, so I had to learn, amen? Had to be exposed. And so parents, let me tell you, moms especially, you got to teach your children. You have to do this. You got to train them. You got to teach them. You got to teach them godly values. Yeah. Godly values. Not necessarily uh, traditional values, because sometimes traditional values are not being really valued. Now, I'm not saying there is some wrong with traditional values. I'm saying but you got to make sure that those traditional values line up with God's values. Because I had some traditions in my home, but they sure weren't godly. We had traditions every holiday. And every time around the holiday, we had alcohol. And with my dad, with alcohol come violence. That was a tradition. That was a culture in my home. Don't have that now. I want peace in my home. <laughs> Amen. Don't want no alcohol. Don't want no violence. The only violence I want is on TV. I can cut it off when I get tired of that. I want godly values in my home. And you know what? Let me tell you something. That's where my children are now. They want, they want godly values. They want peace in their home. I remember, the, you all remember when you used to get in the, get in the, uh, and when you was growing up, when you was a teen. How I many of y'all remember when y'all were teens, and you had to come in at night, and it was like 7, 8 o'clock at night, and y'all get mad because it was a school night. How many of y'all remember that and didn't want to go in? How many of y'all now, boy, y'all can't wait to get in at 7, 8 o'clock at night? <laughs> Well, this entire thing about a change. We used to have every Sunday, and that's including the day. I don't care if it is Mother's Day. I'm getting my nap in today. How many of y'all take naps on Sunday? That's right. Every Sunday. Amen. Before I got saved and before, I'm telling you, when I, when I was younger, didn't want to take no nap, didn't you know, sleep. I said, I'll sleep when I'm back. When I'm dead. Now, should I look forward? My body shut down every Sunday. <laughs> you have to. So my children, they take naps now. <laughs> they do, every Sunday. We look forward to it. That's one of the highlights of our life now. Yes. <laughs> Woo, what you gonna do? Oh no, man. Just Gotta take a nap. But you going to bed later? Yeah, I'm going to take a nap before I get ready for bed. <laughs> but you got to teach your children godly values, godly values. Look, godly values are something that is not taught by you do this, you do that, you do that. It's by living on a consistent basis. That's how you train up a child. It's by teaching them by living. Okay? As you, as you live these godly values, and I can't do all this today because it's a discipleship kind of mentality where you have to be taught on a regular basis 
These are the values that God, or these are the values that God wants in our lives. Not that we choose, but what God wants in our lives. Amen? Amen. You have to teach your children. Now here's something I want you to get. Because I'm going somewhere with this. Teach your children about their godly heritage. Not about inheritance, heritage. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, and I taught this down there as well, and I showed it to them in scripture. In the very beginning of creation, God created us one level below him. Mm -hmm. Let us create man in our image and likeness. In the image of likeness, created he male and female and gave us the rule over the earth, right? Because of the fall, which happened in Genesis chapter three, that's what we talk about more than anything. And God created us to have dominion. When you tell a child that you are a queen, young lady, you are a king. You know, some people, they oh, don't tell them that, why? They're going to be arrogant. No, no, no. You have to tell them that's their heritage. If we don't know it, we're going to teach them that. People tend to become what you feed into them. You know, you used to say you are what you eat. That's the same way mentally. Why don't you tell people who they are? Why don't you tell your children, you know, you are a king. Right now, you're a prince. When you're in my home, you're a prince. When you move, you'll have your own kingdom. But right now, you're a prince. You can't have two kings in my house. <laughs> What about Cheryl? She's the queen, not the king. I'm the king. Who the king in your house? Who's more basic? There you go. Young lady, she said, I'm from Alabama. 
And then as she began to talk, now we ministered at her lunchtime, and she started telling us about how she had been abused and how things was going on in her life. And I asked her a question. I said, who are you? And she said who her name was. I said, that's your name. I said, who are you? And then she told me uh, where she's from. I said, okay, who are you? She didn't know who she was. Nobody ever told her who she was. So she identified herself with the abuse in her life. And then she became the product of somebody else's opinion. This stuff is serious. This stuff is serious. But we don't want to come to church and be serious. We want to come to church and have fun. Ooh, I can't even got my praise on. Yeah, okay. We had church today. Yeah, when are you going to be to church? And a person is in, you know, everybody has a problem when you become an individual. When you recognize your individuality. People have a problem because everybody wants you to be like everybody else. But do you know you have your own individual? Matter of fact, I got that on the screen. That do not make the mistake of trying to mold them into another you. That's my mini me. They're not your mini me. If you want them to be a mini anything, let them be a mini God, a mini Jesus. Don't let them be a you because that means that if there are two of you, one of you all are unnecessary. I know you like, you love your children, but you know, and they remind you so much of yourself, but what you want them to do is to develop who they really are. Because you never know what God has in store for them. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to be just like my dad. I want to be just what God wants me to be. My son will be a football player like me. Your son may not even want to play football. I looked at these sports and, you know, uh, what was it, the ball ball? And he, I mean, now if they really want to play professional ball, but I'm wondering how many of them really would say, man, I wish my dad would just leave me alone and let me be what I want to be. Don't pressure your children to be something you want them to be. And please, I'm telling you, just in case you didn't know it, one of you is enough. We don't need any more of you. So don't make that mistake of trying to create another you, amen? Your child has his or her own special gift and talents. What you have to do is let them, you have to help them develop and find, you know, if you give them certain things to do, sometimes your children will say, I don't want to do that. Well, come on and try it. Well, I don't want to do it. Well, I don't want to force them. Sometimes if they don't get exposed to something, they don't know. Have you ever, let me ask you a question. Now, I'm going to use Skip, for example. I'm going to be nice to you today, Skip, <laughs> I think. Um, but Skip asked me, a long time ago to go jet skiing with, with him. And I told him, no, nah, man, you know, no, no, He said, come on, man, come on, go jet skiing. He said, it's, it's safe. I said, yeah, but you, you can swim. <laughs> he said, no, nah, man, really. So I said, I'm about to stop him because he kept asking every time I go out and work out with him. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, I jog in the morning, 4 o'clock. I said, you come jog with me. I said, you don't have to do the whole eight, just do four. And he shocked me when he did it. And he did it a few times, didn't he? And then I said, okay, he ain't going to say nothing else. And all of a sudden he said, okay, now, I jog with you. He said, now, you, I said, oh, God, now I got to get out. But then I found out I love it. I love it. I love it. Didn't know I would like it. Because I ain't never seen none of us out there on that wall. <laughs> and even when we was out there, we was the only blacks out there on that wall. At least on the jet ski. And Brother Bob back me one time, he said, Pastor, he said, you out there, can you swim? I said, I don't know. He said, you get on that water, you can't swim. I said, I get on the plane, I can't fly. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you this, the best thing to do is don't get in the water. That's right. Amen. Or even worse, don't let the water get into you, because it's not the water that you get in, it's the water that get into you that causes you to drown. Amen. Amen. But everybody have different spells. Sometimes you have to expose them to something that they'll say, oh, I didn't even really know I was good at that. I didn't know I could do that. 
And sometimes parents should say, just try it. If you don't like it, you don't have to keep doing it. But just try it. You know, and you'd be surprised of the gifts. And because what, you know what most of us do? We expose our children to stuff that only we've been exposed to. And we limit them. And you find someone else and say, I'm going to let my daughter do this. I'm going to let my son do this. I'm going to let them do this. I'm going to let them try this. I'm going to let them do it. Uh, you always got your child into something. Yeah, because I don't know what God has in store for them. So I'm going to give them as many opportunities as can, even if I sacrifice my own personal agenda so I can make sure they get opportunities. Because I don't know who God, uh, what God has in store for them. So I'm not going to limit them to my little bitty limitation, my little limited thinking. Is this helping somebody? Amen. Because your child has their own special talents and gifts. You'll be surprised at what they can do. You'll be shocked at what they can do. You need to help them understand and embrace their uniqueness. Yeah. Tell them, be like, be, be, just say, you know what? You don't have to be like me. I want you to be you. I want you to be what God created you to be. And tell them to embrace it. Don't worry about all the pressure that's coming from without. From cyber bullying, from school bullying, from children in the in in, in, the, in your families, from cousins, <coughs> because they may not be, well, they may not want to be that. Leave them alone if they don't want to do. It. If they want to read, let them read. Well, all you do is read. That's what you need to do is read. Amen. And then when you know something is harmful, like all these computer games. And all this other stuff, you have to be the one to say, no, we're going to give you so much time in this, but we're going to take, we're going to, you're going to have to do something else, we're going to get you exposed to something else. That is a responsibility of a parent, structure. You get so much time in this, but no, you're not going to sit around all day. Because some of you all know, y'all marry some, some couch potatoes. All they do is watch TV. Or play games. Uh-oh, I'm stepping on some toes today. We didn't need to be <laughs> See, folks, what we have to come to the realization is only God knows the purpose of these children. The same way God only, only God knows our purpose. I'm going to give you a scripture and we'll get out here. Listen, folks, I'm, I mentioned this to you before. People in this church have heard me so many times say this. If any of you knew me growing up, I love sports. Love sports. If I had my way, I would have probably chosen sports as my career because I just love sports. I did not go to church when I was growing up. Church was something that I didn't, it wasn't in my it wasn't even in my, my, my foundation when just church was not there for me. And if you had found me, if you had known me growing up, there was no way you would have looked at me and said, Brother Wendy, you're going to be a pastor. You never would have thought that. Because God already knew my purpose. I did. I had no idea what I was going to do in life, but I know what I would have chosen. I would have chosen sports, some kind of sport. Uh, but when I when I realized that the life that I had chosen wasn't what God had chosen for me, and I realized I was unfulfilled. You know how you're doing something, but you're you're doing it. You know you got a job, but you're really not fulfilled. So you're trying this, you're trying that. You go to the military, you're doing this, you're doing that. And you take a well, and all of a sudden, you know, you're doing pretty good. Now nah, this is not. Then you find out yourself, something ain't right. Something is not right. I'm not being, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not fulfilled. And my dad used to tell me this, boy, just get a good job and get you some seniority built up. And, and see, this was his limited thinking. Like I said, I don't blame him, but it was being passed down. So we were looking for a job. We were looking for purpose. Jobs. Jobs are not always purpose. Because you can work a job, it can be good money, but you're still not fulfilled. Only God knows your purpose. Amen? Amen. So let me finish up with this. Exodus chapter 2. Beginning at verse number 1. 
The people of Israel were in slavery. First of all, when they first went into Egypt, they were not slaves. Listen to me, I'm almost done. They were not slaves when they went into Egypt. Joseph is the one that was the interest for them to go into slavery. You have to read the whole story yourself in Genesis. However, uh, a new king rose up in Egypt that didn't know Joseph. And so they began to look at the people of Israel, how they began to increase it. And they were so afraid of them, they said, wait a minute, these people, if they ever go to war against us, it's going to be more of them. They're going to win. So what we have to do, let's destroy their spirits, first of all. So they began to put them in slavery, and then they began to uh, uh, put all this labor on them. And the funny thing about it, let me show you how good God is, because this happened with black folks, too, that the more they put on us, the more we increase. How is it? There's something about it, that the more pressure they put on us, instead of having an adverse effect, all of a sudden we saw it increasing. Amen. Amen. And so what happened is that they told, it, the Pharaoh told the, the midwives, Hebrew midwives, that, listen, we can't, we, we got to do something about this situation. So when they get ready to give birth, then I want you to take the sons and I want you to kill them when they're about to give birth and let the women, let the females be alive. But the, the Hebrew women, they, they love God more than they did the Pharaoh. Amen. I wish some people love God more than they do us sitting, whatever. Number 45, they would call the But anyway, if we, they, def, they refused to obey him. And so what happened is these godly women, Hebrew women, were so intent on doing what God wanted them to do, they wouldn't kill these kids. Amen? Amen. Let's go to Genesis, I mean Exodus 2, beginning at verse 1. And there was a man of the house of Levi took to a wife, a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. How many of you all believe when you have children, you got goodly children? Yeah. All y'all ladies, y'all got good, they, they special. It was something about this woman that she said, you know what, they may kill me, but they ain't killing my child. There are some women that will say, you know what, I will put my life before ahead of this child. Yep. Amen. Amen. And this is what this woman did. She loved her child so much that she said, you know what, I'm going to hide him as long as I can. And so she did. She hid it for three months. And in verse number three it says, and when she could no, when she could no longer hide him, she took uh, for him an ark of bush rushes and dubbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the riverbank, which means she hid the child right where she knew the Pharaoh's daughter was going to be coming to take a bath in her maidens. And so she hid the child. Now some people say she, it, even the Bible don't say this, it didn't say that she floated the child down the Nile River. But that's what people say because they watch movies. But she didn't float the child. She put the child and she anchored the child right by the flags by the river bank. Nobody would put their child in and, and throw them down the river. No, she hid him. Amen. Verse number four. And his sister, now look at this. This is not even talked about a lot. His sister stood afar off to wit or to know what would be done to him. So she was watching the whole thing. And it wasn't like he was out there for no three or four days floating up and down the Nile River. See, you got to read the scripture. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maids walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. So she, she, she saw it among the flags. Where was it? Where, 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 where did she put the child? By the flags. Where did she find it? By the flags. And when she had opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Now let me help you out. There are some ladies who have never given birth to children. And somehow they feel like, well, Mother's Day don't mean much to me. But you know what I'm saying? There are some of you all who have been almost better than some of the moms who have given birth to children. Amen. You know, Sometimes, you know, you have society to make you feel like that if you have never given birth, something's wrong with you. But that don't mean anything is wrong with you because God may have another plan for your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. And you got to accept God's plan because everybody can't do 
uh, what everybody else can do. You were called to do something different. But look what happened. And she said she had compassion and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Now, you know that she was the Pharaoh's daughter, and she knew the decree that the Pharaoh had for the sons. But what did she do? Instead of her doing a, or, or, or killing the son, she herself, because she had motherly love, motherly instincts for the child, that instead of her killing it, what she did is she, uh, she decided she was going to keep him. She had compassion. Then said his sister, talking about this, this child's sister, uh, to Pharaoh's daughter, should I go and call to uh, be a nurse of the Hebrew women that may uh, nurse the child for thee? And the Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. Look at God. Look at God. She didn't want her child to die because she knew her child was special. How I many of y'all have special children? And you don't want that child to die. So you will put yourself on the line and you say, I know that this child has a purpose in life. And God did not let this child be born to die. So I don't know the child's purpose, but I do know that this child is not going to die on my watch. Hallelujah. And God had a plan for that child. And it says, and the Pharaoh daughter said, go, go get the mate. And she went and got her mother, which was the child's mother as well. And the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee wages. Hallelujah. I mean, now she's now getting paid to nurse her own child. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> she's getting, this is how God set this up. She was going to, she was, if she had killed the child, obeying the Pharaoh, just imagine what would have happened. But instead, she kept the child. And then she not only kept the child, hid as long as she could. Then she sent the child into a place where she knew the Pharaoh's daughter and then took her chance with the Pharaoh's daughter because she evidently knew that maybe the Pharaoh's daughter had more compassion than the Pharaoh. And so she took a chance and she did that. And then when she found out that the Pharaoh's daughter was looking for her, that she going to nurse her own child and say, I'm going to give you wages to nurse your own child. Who but God can do that? Yeah. Amen. Amen. And it said, and the, and the child, and the women took the child, and she nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought uh, him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and became her son. So she said, I'm going to let you have him for your son. Rather than me have him and he being killed, I'd rather for you to have him as your son. And guess who called his name Moses? The Pharaoh's daughter, not his mom. Amen. Why? It said because she had taken, she, she said because I drew him out of the water. Now, in closing, I want you to know that if you're trying to get your child to be another you, if you are allowing pressure from without to try to make your child be this way, act this way, some of you young people, when people are trying to get you to act a certain way or they're trying to get you to be a certain way instead of being the original you, you don't know what your real purpose is because you're so busy trying to be like Tupac, trying to be like so-and-so. You need to be who you are. Now, I'm saying Tupac because I don't know who all the rap artists are. I know Kanye West. I heard about him. But he's not of my era. These people that, that you know, 2 chain is it 2 chain, 3 chain, 4 chain, 2 chain. T.I. Yeah. Am I hitting him? Yeah. 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 Well, see, I'm not knocking him. I'm just saying that. I mean, how many T.I.s is this? One. 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 How many two balls? One. One. Well, I mean, how many was it, period? <laughs> what, what I'm saying is that, why would you want to be another him instead of being original you? Why would someone want to, and why would you let people pressure to join a game? I grew up in Kenlock. I didn't join nobody's games. And I, I'm telling you, I wasn't bad. I, I don't want you to say, oh, he didn't even bad. No, I wasn't bad, but I went everywhere I wanted to go. I had, I had a bike. I wore my bike everywhere. And wherever I wanted to go, that's where I went. When they told me you ain't supposed to be on that side, I said, I'll be wherever I want to go. I went everywhere I wanted to go. I didn't never join a game. I didn't believe in that. I didn't take the pressure to join the game. I didn't let people put me in this position. You know what? They thought, they said, don't mess with that boy. That boy will fight you. So it wasn't, it wasn't that I had to fight. They just knew I would. See, because I was going to be me. 
What's wrong with being who God created you to be? You don't have to be like everybody else. You are so unique. Moms, your children are unique. How do you know? How do you know that that child that you gave birth to, that child that you love, how do you know if that child may be the next deliverer? Because folks, we in need of a deliverer. Just like the people of Israel needed a Moses. Just like in the days of Jesus when they tried to kill Jesus when he was a small boy. And he was a deliverer. You know, we live in a time now we need to deliver. And that deliverer don't necessarily have to be no male. It can be a female. Yeah. What I'm trying to tell you is that don't try to make your children and mold your children. Let God, give them access to God. Let them, let God begin to shape and mold their lives. Let God begin to speak into their lives. Teach them godly values by example. And watch and see what God will do. And you never know. That person may rise up and they may say, well, this is my call. No matter where they are today. Because even if you talk about Malcolm X, he was in jail. But when he got out of jail, he became a leader. Don't look at where they are. Nelson Mandela spent 40 some years in jail. What I'm trying to tell you, you don't know what God has in store for them. Just don't you try to interfere and get and, and try to do what God, only God can do. You teach them godly values. You do it by example. You stay consistent. Keep being that godly mom. That's the seasoned mom that need to be uh, taking these children and not letting the, the, the videos, not letting these games, and not letting all this other foolishness raise their children. Yeah, I already said social media. You, you, have, a, you have impact. You are the first line of defense. So when the Bible says, train them up in the way they should go. Awesome responsibility because you are training for the next generation. You're going, to be, you're going to be gone one day, and they're going to still be with you. There are some of us today who say, you know what, if it wasn't for my mom, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. In the grave, been in the grave, but you still have to say, thank God for my mom, who stood by me when my daddy was sick. Who didn't give up on me. So moms, I want to say happy Mother's Day to you again, and I want to tell you, you gave birth to some wonderful children. Help them develop their uniqueness to become who God say he want them to be. And then sometimes it's got to get out of the way. Amen. 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 Because we never know if this is the next delivery. It might be in our midst. It could be someone right there. Who's sitting out there right now? Maybe in the children's church. Maybe in the youth ministry right now. Maybe that little child that you all holding back there. You never know. So what our job is create a culture so that we can be what God we would be. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a praise. All for these things.